It's another edition of the KSO Show. Yes, we are back yet again. Right after we just did a Trumaine Carroll KSO Show, you know, touching on um, his hire, the strength, new strength and conditioning coach for Kansas State. Just did a, you know, a nice uh, 13 to 15 minute podcast just talking about our thoughts on the new hire. But this is going to supposed to be a questionnaire, you know, that we put out on, on the message board this past Thursday. Got a ton of questions to get to still. And even since then, K-State has won a basketball game. They've won a baseball game. You know, a lot of, you know, some good news and, you know, strength and conditioning coach coming in. Some good news in K-State sports the last, uh, you know, less than a week ago. As, you know, a couple wins. Baseball just started last, what, Thursday? Uh, they're 2-2. They're two and two. And uh, K State got their their second conference win of the season, beating TCU um, in Fort Worth. You know it's been long awaited. Broke a 13 game losing streak. You know that we'll obviously get into talking about more here because I'm sure there's going to be questions. You know revolving around K State basketball and stuff. So we'll get to that mm-hmm. in a second. I'm with Dy. It's Grant Flanders. So let's get this show on the road. Got a ton of questions to get to, and we want to get to them all. You know, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Ema GP uh, starts us off, you know. No, that's actually not a question. Sorry, I should have actually been prepared for that one. He wants to mess around with us, and I love it. He says, took somebody else today. Can't come up with a question. That was, you know, after the KU beating that, you know, it was, it's a good response for what happened after that. But like I said, K-State's won a basketball game since then. Tua Cat has a couple questions for us, D.Y., he asks, I know you don't have the answers, but want your opinion slash, slash speculation. What is the root issues with recruiting and football? What are the uh, what has to change in your opinion? Concrete material things, not just generalities. Can we can we really lock up the state in recruiting? Is it a realistic goal? Obviously, this is a lot of questions. This is coming after <laughs> losing Kaden Kade, Kade Crawford, which is you yeah. know a big loss. But yeah, I mean that's a that's a question that is. You yeah. know, emotionally coming after that, but you know, it's no, a, it's a valid it's, question yeah. and and a necessary one after losing sure. Kaden, Kaden Crawford, Iowa. I'm not mm-hmm. going to pull any punches here or or make it sound great. I, as everyone knows, I do admire this coach staff. I do believe in them, but that is a loss that is really we're we're getting close to the point where it's probably not acceptable. You have to be landing Kaden Crawford in this situation, so I'm not going to smooth that over. What has to happen? Uh, what are the issues? I really, they just ha- at some point. I do think, and I, and I don't know if it's the same coaches over and over that are doing it well, and the same ones that are not. I I couldn't tell you. I don't have all of those details, but there is, you know, probably too many cases where some of the top targets they have a, some great relationships at Kansas State, but just not enough. Uh, a great relationship with Taylor Brad is is not enough. They need to be as close to the assistant coach recruiting them as they are, are to Taylor Bratt. And that's how you win recruiting battles that are that are tough, that you're going to be facing um, a lot of other Power 5 programs for because guess what, that, that coach on the other side of the line recruiting against you, he's probably got that relationship, not just the, the recruiting director. So that that's one thing that's kind of cropping up to me. A little bit of COVID stuff because I do think they benefit from having guys on campus and I do think they benefit from having guys at camp for evaluation purposes. So I do think there's a little bit out of their hands, not enough for me to gloss over some of the misses, but a little bit there. But at the end of the day, need a little bit better relationships. Um, Can you lock up the state in recruiting? Yeah, but you have to take every single loss seriously and learn from it too. I'm not saying it's happening at this school, but at other schools you cover or just coaching in general fall into this trap and you don't get somebody. I think it happens in basketball too, not just in Kansas State, but other schools and coaches say, oh, we want kids to be here. You know, yeah, that's a great thing to say, but th- that's not how you win either. I, that, that's mm-hmm. the easy thing to say when you don't get a kid that you want because – At the end of the day, guess what recruiting is? It's your job to make those kids want to be here. Mm -hmm. And so I think they need to have some of those hard conversations. But I do think they need better relationships with some of the coaches have to develop better relationships. Um, I know you want concrete things, not generalities. And to be honest, at Kansas State, winning a little bit more 
and playing a little bit more significant gains will help. But they're, I'll be honest, I, KSO, me and Flano have both been at KSO since 2017. Uh, they're, they've had some good teams. They started out what four one this year, you know, four, four I think four four one in the Big Twelve, four zero in the Big Twelve, some you know along those lines. Uh, they went on that winning streak after the Arkansas State game, but like, how many games have they really played? How many games of significance with n- national implications have they played? And I mean, besides upsetting Oklahoma, they're just not quite there yet. Mm-hmm. And seven and five, eight and fours. Uh, the uh, probably the epitome of good enough, but not quite there yet in terms of what you want your ceiling to be. You want to be playing games in November that matter. And they're just not there yet. Absolutely. I think you laid that question out really well for our listeners. Tua Cat keeps us going with what what is salvageable from this basketball team? Will Bruce possibly have any effectiveness recruiting at this point? If he is to stay on won't it just dig us a deeper hole for next year for the guys to climb out of uh and make it worse and make this job less desi- desirable than it already is uh, uh, interesting question yeah it's an interesting question i'll give him my feedback yeah. he says what is salvageable from this basketball team this particular one i mean they're not winning the b12 tournament they're not winning the nit they're not they're not going to the nit they're not going to the ncaa tournament they're probably not going to the cbi they're, they're not going to make it to you know, the, the weekend of the Big 12 tournament. So salvageable, yeah. it, cring, it cringes to say, but still progress, getting better game to game. That's really the only thing salvageable in terms of will Bruce have any effectiveness recruiting at this point? Unfortunately, that answer is probably no because um, they've already landed Maximus Edwards and Logan Landers. Maybe there'll be a spot or two to add some more guys, but at the end of the day, that's not an overwhelmingly impressive class compared to the last two that they have signed and then moving forward i mean bruce doesn't have a lot of years on his contract in general that's Mm -hmm. going to make it tough to recruit they're not in a position even if they do keep them to give him an extension so the the future recruiting is going to be hamstrung and that's just the crew of what position they're in and and Yes, that sucks for Bruce, but he's also dug this hole himself. Mm-hmm. Um, if he is to stay on, want to just dig us a deeper hole for the next cl- guy to climb out of? Uh, not, I guess not. I, 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 I understand the premise of that question, but I guess not necessarily because I, I don't think that they're making the NCAA tournament next year either. But I, I think they're going to win more than three or five, three or four Big Twelve games, and that I mean they've only won two th- this year. But next year, I'd say they at least win four or five. Yeah, that's not big enough of an improvement, and I and I get. People want him gone, and, and, and maybe you should be. I mean, I'm not here to say you shouldn't, should or shouldn't. But in terms of if he stays, will it dig a deeper hole? I don't know that it will. It would in recruiting, but not maybe on the court. Yes. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think recruiting, the more they lose, obviously, uh, you laid out, that out pretty well. The only thing I would add to that is, yeah, not much salvageable from the season besides just seeing progress from these youngsters um, and, you know, it's good to see Mike playing well, you know, against TCU in this last game. We'll see what happens uh, with his play in the future. He hasn't been good really all season, and he finally shows up, and he has a chance to come back next year. The coaches want him back. If they're back, they're going to keep harping on uh, Mike McGraw coming back. By the way, if you're interested, um, before I keep on a- a- answering this question, if you're interested in keeping up with the Bruce Weber stuff, you know, we, we, we hear rumblings, you know, Pretty much, it feels like every day of of something going on on that front. So if you, if you want to, you know, stay up to date with that kind of stuff, join the message board, and you'll see exactly right where we're at and what we're thinking about Bruce Weber um, and what his you know job security looks like for next year. But you know, we'll keep that off the podcast and just talk about you know ifs and buts and what what could happen if he is back next year. And that's the question getting taken. Let me put it this way: when it comes to recruiting. K-State football recruiting doesn't look great right now. It's still leaps and bounds better than K-State basketball recruiting right yeah, now. Yeah, and next year's basketball recruiting might be worse than Exactly, this because year's. they just proved that after a really bad season last year in basketball, they couldn't you know, rebound and, and keep the great classes going along because they had two really good classes and now you have, with 2019-2020, now con- and now they've handcuffed themselves. Yeah, and now you have the contract to be negatively recruited as well. Um, yeah. Another question for him. I'll just run into this. Yeah, it looks like one, one more, more for me. Uh, not KSU related, but interested in your opinion. Will Urban Meyer be successful in the NFL? Dude can flat out coach and evaluate talent. His record speaks for itself. He's no doubt 
also a polarizing figure. Will his transition from college to pro be more like Jimmy Johnson and Pete Carroll or more like Nick Saban, Chip Kelly, and Steve Spurrier? To me, it's the latter. I think it's more like Saban, Chip Kelly, and Steve Spurrier. And I said that even before some of the, the coaching hires that he has made. I think he's made some poor coaching hires already. Scott Linehan's his offensive coordinator, who's not really been impressive overly impressive at any stop that he has made and even before some of those hires were made um you know regardless of what you feel about he tried to hire chris doyle obviously the iowa coach that was fired for misconduct whether you think he deserved to be fired or not that that's beyond that that's not really the crew of what i'm about to say but if urban meyer can't understand that that what hire is going to be so poorly received that he's going to have to rescind it a day later if he can't recognize or come to the, you know, grasp that that was going to happen, then I kind of worry about the future just in general that he couldn't pick up on that, especially with his checkered past himself um, in terms of how he's handled things prior to this. It just, that wasn't a really good decision. So I think he's already making some poor decisions. On top of that, even before those hires, I said that, you know, what Urban Meyer, what made him tick in college was that he had all the best talent in the world. He was never an X's and O's guru. People don't understand that and haven't recognized that before. Urban Meyer, in terms of football, X's and O's, and breaking out plays, it might look good for you on TV as an analyst, but that was never his go-to as a football coach. That was never what made him tick. That was never what made him successful. What made him successful was he was the best head coaching recruiter that there was in the country every time that he was hired to be a head coach. He could recruit, you know, anybody. Um however he wanted he was the best recruiting head coach that I've ever seen on top of that he also was a great motivator and a great guy that really encapsulate energy and culture and a program for a few years and then it would fall apart but at the end of the day those were the two things he's good at guess what that stuff that doesn't work in the NFL those those guys tune you out if you're kind of like a little bit of a car salesman type of guy. And if you're just an energy rob rob motivator that's a hell of a recruiter, you're probably a little bit salesman and that gets picked apart in the NFL. In the NFL, everyone has good players. You don't have the best players. He went to places and he coached at places and he recruited at places where he had better talent than the other team that he was across from. That doesn't happen in the NFL either. So I just think what made him tick, what made him good in college doesn't translate to the NFL. Um, coaching actually matters more, actually, in game coaching. He can manage a game pretty well, but in game coaching, X's and O's, and that's really not his thing. He was never, he's, you know, people, some people don't, don't know this. Urban Meyer was never an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator. He, ne- he was never a coordinator. He went straight from wide receivers coach to head coach. That is crazy. You know what he doesn't know how to do, and this might be part of that, not being in a DC or OC. He's bad at finding character guys to construct his roster with. Oh yeah, he's, uh, he's very, he's very. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing that I would say about. Yeah, him. no, he's very bad uh, at certain things. <laughs> now I will say because he's going to luck out and probably get the best quarterback prospect in twenty years in yeah, Trevor that's, Lawrence, that's luck. and and that could be what really saves Urban Meyer. He might. You yeah. don't have to be a fantastic coach or, <laughs> or a top five coach in the NFL if you if Trevor Lawrence is what we think. Yes, is. if he if he reaches the ceiling that people project him as you know um then yes he he lucked out a thousand percent over so thank you to a cat for three questions here if we have some more from you later that's great if not we appreciate the questions this one's for you yeah it is what am i missing this is from power cat 80 what am i missing for why my girl's been has earned playing so many minutes over anyone else on the team as a senior leader yeah i mean that's a great question um you know it's Especially after that game against Kansas, because this is when, obviously, like like I said earlier, this is when this uh, when this questionnaire, then this thread was made. So that's that's a valid question. Mike McGurl is getting his time because they need him really. They they don't have really any other option because he's the only experience on the team, and he 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 wants the ball in his hands. He's not very good with it in his hands right now. But if they if they gave it if they did give the keys to a freshman, I genuinely do believe that could. And because they're doing their best, giving Nigel as much keys to the program as possible, but not fully throwing it at him. And I think that's to save him, just in case he has games like Mike McGurl has had throughout this way, throughout this bad stretch that he had of a season. But they play together anyway. So no, they do. But, 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 but Mike so, McGurl is given the role of ball handler. Yeah, but he's he's talking about why is McGurl getting so much playing time if he continues to suck? Is basically what the question is. Well, I guess. 
because the coaches believe in him. And I mean, I still think that's part of my answer is the fact that they they need yeah. to. They, there's yeah. no there's no other option. It's not so, like they have a guy behind him. It's the way they recruited and the way they allowed they guys to leave to last be, year. To be honest, the roster construction is pretty poor. That's probably the answer at this point a little bit because like the only guys that can handle the ball are Mike and Nigel and Selton, but Selton turns it over at a higher clip than both of them. So um, and the roster construction would be better if these guys were a few years into the program. But yeah, yeah since they're but, all but freshmen but, and, and but, one but, Mike, but, and Mike isn't a great a great player by any means. But there's there's not enough guards. I mean, your your guys that can handle the ball are a senior and a freshman. There's no one in between. Exactly. They didn't recruit That's well. Why they they have kept more David Sloan, but I'll but, on yeah, that but they have, but, but they have like five bigs and two point guards. It just doesn't make sense. And it's easier said than that. I said they sh- they should have brought back David Sloan. That wasn't just an easy hey come back. David Sloan wanted guaranteed starting position and they couldn't hand that out they like to be honest to these guys but hindsight they could have started david and nigel but next to each other and had mike come off the bench yeah they could have done that but i don't know how that makes it a little bit better but i don't know if it's enough bigger i think the no not not to make it but you could win five six games like people expected possibly but i think it's a problem when you have 12 scholarship players like four or five of them are bigs yeah i mean in this day and age how do you have five bigs out of 12 no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Um, you know, in case, uh, I, I think that's something that Bruce Weber's stuck with for, you know, his tenure. He's had, I mean, uh, James Love on the end of the bench. Nigel Shad on the end of the bench should have been off the team, you know, after the first year that they were there. Yeah, but they were I, I, guess, yeah I guess it just it clouds my judgment of them a little bit when they have more fives than guys that can handle the ball. So, but I guess, I mean, we're getting off track. The question is, why is Mike McGraw getting more playing time? They but, have no but, other option. But that is why. <laughs> because they don't have an, any other option. They don't guys. have any other option. They didn't recruit anybody. They have two point guards on the entire roster. Unless you want to call Rudy a point guard. But he's really not. He plays the I, two. I wouldn't call Mike a point guard. I, w- I wouldn't call... I call Selton and Nigel the point guards. And even that stretch, a stretch for S- Selton. stretch for Selton. And they Nigel. don't even want Nigel to be... The, They'd, you, they'd rather have someone else, like David Sloan, handling the ball so Nigel can come off screens and yeah, catch it's, and it's, shoot. So it's, it's, if you want to know the answer, it's, it's an indictment on the And roof. it's too bad. Rudy Williams, they looked at as a guy that might be able to come in and be a David Sloan. He's not a point guard. No. He's not. And Nigel plays better off the ball. I mean, the answer is it's a little bit of an indictment on the recruiting that they don't have a lot of pure ball handlers. That's what. Yeah, it's an indictment on a lot of things that... Um, this coaching staff has failed at. Obviously, yeah, we could you know harp on all the great things that they've done, but right now it's it's not great stuff for this program and the coaching staff because yeah. they've dug this hole for themselves. Yeah, but, I was gonna say it, it, that's what it comes down to. You you said it. They they dug it. They made a they made mistakes and kind of dug them a hole. But I think we can move on from. Can that coaches actually get considerably better at recruiting? And if so, have you covered an example during your time at Rivals? I mean. Ed Warner got better when he was at Ohio State. He was pretty poorly at it. I think you can get better. To be honest, you get better at time, too, in a certain place because you become comfortable at the product that you're selling because it's now your product and not someone else's product that you're trying to make your product that you're selling. So I think you can get better just by being at an institution for longer. You can get better by recruiting an area for longer. Connor Riley never recruited St. Louis until he got to K-State. He's starting to recruit it better. So, yeah, I think you can get better. I know the staff has its struggles, but in comparison to the Snyder 2.0 staff, is our current group of coaches better at recruiting or roughly similar? Uh, I think moderately better, I would say. I think the last staff... um, it, it doesn't take too much to be moderately better than the last staff. There was literally months out of the year where they weren't allowed to recruit. So um, this is much different than that. There's four top 10 Kansas players left that we're still chasing in football. To put the over under at one, the one being number we're able to get committed out of those four, what's more likely zero or more than one? Um, I guess I, I haven't brought up the, the top 10 in Kansas in a while. So I don't, off the top, no who were the four left, but I think they're going to get Jaron Kanak. Herzog would be one. Of the uh, yeah, top. Herzog's probably another one that's probably a Myers. little bit more 50-50. I don't think Gavin, Gavin – I mean, I'm giving away premium information at this uh, point. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to pump my brakes a little bit, but I, I, I think that more than one, man, that doesn't seem a whole lot difficult. If, if it's not more than one, then um, there's more disappointments ahead. I'll say that. But I – I. It could be just one, I guess. There's there's a chance. All right. 
Has a recent K-State basketball or football coach ever just coached the length, out the length of his contract and then moved on? We keep, and he, we keep hearing that the school AD or whoever just doesn't have the money to fire Bruce, and I get that. But assuming that is the case, how does the end of the Bruce era play out? Gene can't realistically extend him based on the results, but he can't have a coach and staff with no years left. On. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I see what you're saying because usually you see coaches get extended or because of recruiting purposes mm-hmm. or, or they get removed and – could neither one of those happen? Yeah, I think it's very, very rare. And I don't know that Bruce Weber coaches out the the entirety of his contract. I think at some point um, he'll either retire, be removed, or get another extension, of course. I don't think he'll coach out the entirety of his contract, but I don't think he'll coach next year on a new contract. So you're basically saying... But does he have more than one year left? I think he's 2023, I think. So, yeah, 2023 is I think, his contract. Yeah, is I to. think next year would be a big dictator. Well, next year is going to be the do-or-die season for... Assuming yeah. he's back. We don't know Assuming for sure. he's back. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. Is check well, out the message. We, 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 we didn't think this year would be a do-or-die season. We didn't think it would be as poor as it is. Exactly. So, That's true. Does Weber need to start paying players to come play next year? Why not at this point? Uh, yeah, I don't think that's something to turn the business of doing. Uh, <laughs> Do we have any good news? Well, we said today, well, Tremaine Carroll being hired as a new strength coach. I know when he asked that question, that wasn't the case, but I think that can be considered good news. And K State getting a basketball win and and, and, be, and getting two baseball wins. Yeah, since since probably both all of that since he posted his question on Thursday. So, yeah, there there is some good news. You kind of get to dig a little bit for <laughs> these days, but they're there. I, and then recruiting, we'll see. Will K State football ever land to recruit again? Yes, I think in the near future. Um, most impactful 2020. You're not even saying who these people are. Like, oh, that's one that, of the big part about it. Like, they want to hear their their, their do screen they really? name. But do they really? Okay, that's something you can ask. Them. This will be a test. Whoever's <laughs> listening when we post this on the so message just, board, <laughs> make sure you let us know if you want to hear your message board name on these. Because I'm just zipping through. I already through know Black Emo would like to hear a shot. Oh Come well, on. you just gave him one. I wouldn't have gave it to you, dude. I know, I know it. Damn. Most impactful 2021 recruit <laughs> this coming season. Most impactful. Oh, so that's out of the guys they just signed. Who who do I think plays a little bit? Yeah. Oh, who who do I? Um, is anyone going to play early? What do you think? <sighs> I'm trying to think of. Um, I'm kind of, I have, I'm actually going back. I mean, the, it's it's. I mean, we probably want to pick from the early enrollees. Yeah, but I don't know if that's a group that. Would play early, well, and I would. I love Andrew Line Gang, Ling Gang, and Jake Rubley, well, but yeah, they're they not. Can. They're not going to play early. No, you're right. But who else? Um, I, yeah, I guess Pritchard's not going to play a bunch unless unless injuries pile up. But that's even thing. Bray Wood, Wood won't. Yep. Um, so I'm looking for this year, maybe one of those receivers, Hawkins or Garcia. Okay, that makes sense. That it'd be that one of those two, sense. or sleeper, Devon Weathers at running back. Oh yeah. Yeah, see, I was thinking, but who's the running back again? Devin Weathers. He's, you know, he yep. had a great high school, you know, season, sen- season, senior yeah. season. Senior I said season, season. season. Senior Without season. having to rank the whole staff, who are the top two recruiters and who are the top two coaches when it comes to developing players on field coaching, et cetera? Uh, who do I think is the best recruiter on this staff? And you, you're talking assistant coaches because Chris Klein's probably the best recruiter. Um, assistant coaches. Give me a Van Malone for my answer for one of the yeah. top two. Van had a really good. It, it probably differs on the, the the different cycles, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. But if I'm going to combine both cycles and combine the way they evaluate and the way that they can persuade, convince kids to come, I'm going to say my the two best ones to me, Brian Anderson. Forgot about Anderson. I think he's got to be up there too. Yeah, which you're, is which is there's a lot of good recruiters because so you're of, you're surprised BA and Malone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, but then I also think of Connor Riley as Connor Riley. As a, Connor Riley is one of the better evaluators uh-huh. on the team on the on the staff. Um, that guy can evaluate talent with the best of them. I, I would say for me, I might go BA and Klanderman. Who's the better recruiter out of Messingham and Klanderman? Uh, probably Klanderman, just because he's a little bit more young, a little bit more charismatic. But uh-huh. Mess is okay. I think yeah. he's he's fine. He's he's not off, not holding them back. Now that we have basically seen a year of the basketball team, how would you re rank the freshman individual rivals rankings? Um, I would keep Nigel as Nigel still Nigel. Well, I guess we'll just order them. I would I would have Nigel number one. Uh-huh. 
Uh, I would have Davion, Davion number two, Davion both four two. stars. Selton's and borderline keep, four star. But I would keep Davion as a four. Third. I would probably make Selton a high three at this point, low yeah. four. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely fair for sure. Yeah, and then, Siri might be like a two because I don't know what if he. I worry about what he turns into for for this particular team. I think Lingard could have a role, just maybe for and at some point in his career because he can shoot and has length, even though he can only guard a five and not many fives. <laughs> it's like you said earlier, though. It's like, man, they got to get rid of at least one of those guys so they can try to get this roster back on track. With because they need more guards. guards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, no offense to either of those kids, but there's no reason to have Siri and Lingard. No, there's not. I mean, and and that's the thing is, I, I think they had an idea in their mind that they were going to somehow pull off something to fill that 12th roster maybe spot. They thought, before, maybe they like thought maybe Parker Stewart or something like they, that. But yeah, or maybe they thought Lin, or maybe they thought Lingard could guard more than one spot. Well, that he wasn't can't. no. He's the worst defender on the team. And that's the only reason because he's a he's a really solid offensive skilled. player, skilled. First skilled. Um, that's because he's shown flashes in the little bit of time he's been on the floor yeah. on that side. I would put him above but Lewis only. I would put him above defensive. Lewis only because he can score a little bit. And that's the thing is they 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 personally Bruce said it just a week or two ago. He actually has Lewis ahead on the the depth chart or whatever you want to call it, or the rotation um, as the the third. Yeah, five. but but that but it's also because I mean Bruce loves defense and Carlton can't guard exactly. anything. Exactly, and he's. And I, yeah, I don't really blame him. Having Carlton out there is interesting. <laughs> I think, yeah, eventually but, he could but, be something. But I just he like just the way Lingard can shoot, man. Exactly. No, his offense is, is exciting. Um, in, in your opinion, does it hurt the future of Kansas State basketball more to let Bruce go after this season or go into next season with the Lane Duck coach from running the program? Yeah, I mean, these these, co- these questions are fair. They're, they're, we're kind of getting a little redundant here. Mm-hmm. Not, you, know, you want to know my opinion. What I, my opinion is... That if you're not prepared to extend them, then it probably isn't a good idea to have a lame duck coach. I'm not telling them what to do, and I, and I don't know what to do. I'm not qualified for those decisions, but having a lame duck coach is, and that's what it would be because if he doesn't get yeah. an extension, unless he can prove himself again next year or have a good season, which seems hard to foresee with, yep. the, with this particular group. Not that he gets Bruce, but if he doesn't have a new contract, I mean, because then you're kind of, you know, sacrificing two recruiting classes in a row. So that's, but I'm a recruiting oriented guy. That's the way I think. Well, we both are. That's yeah. what you have to be when you, when, first of all, you work for rivals. And yeah. second of all, I, I would say, if you want to run a good wants, program, you got to recruit. Well. Yeah, and I would say, I, I know what he's getting at, and he's right. Um, you are, I wouldn't say, I don't know if hurting is the word, but you are, Setting yourself up for, I don't want to say failure, but you're setting yourself up for um, possible disaster by letting things go just as planned right now. Exactly. Because, I mean, here's the thing is there's no track record of, of Weber being able to go into the transfer market and make something happen. This would be his year if they do retain him. To. This would be yeah. his year to go there and get at least one or two instant impact guys not junior college guys, not even high school guys. I want D1, you know, experienced guys that can come into this program and perform. And he hasn't shown that. So, yeah, it's a valid question and everything as far as it goes. But if he is retained, that's something that's going to be very important if they want to, you know, have any chance of getting extended in the future, I would say. Yeah, good people want good things to happen to them. But, yeah. uh, um, and I think they would even admit, like Coach Weber and them, that you, you put them on the same contract that really – it really limits what they can do in terms of recruiting. Yep. How frustrating do you think is it for Spit and football recruiting? I know the guy is a thousand percent email, but knowing he is constantly fighting a mountain sized climb, has to start waiting on to do it at some point in question whether he wouldn't be better off somewhere else. Uh, yeah, I mean I don't want to get into conversations and stuff of that nature, but I would tell you that he loves Kansas State and um, in terms of questioning whether he'd be better off somewhere else, I don't think that that thought would ever cross his mind. That's just you said it, thousand percent email. That's what Taylor Bratt is. He said sped. It's Taylor Bratt, and he is. And uh, you know, recruiting is not for the faint of heart. You're going to have great days. You're going to have bad days. And I think he knows that his life is recruiting. 
kind of like mine. Do you like his his hair? I don't. I don't. I, I, do. I hope. To. But I'm also a part of the flow gang. So yeah, you like, are. You are. You both are in the flow gang. But mm-hmm. you, I know he might be listening to this. But I don't like your hair, dude. I like it, uh, Taylor. No, Brat. No. Why do I call you Taylor? Who calls you Taylor? Who calls Who calls Brat Taylor? No, nobody. Nobody. <laughs> He's probably going to call you and make fun of you. <laughs> I'm excited about it. If well, you were the athletic director or head coach and didn't have money issues, what would you implement on this current football staff to get better recruiting results? Um. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I would... Rec- recruiting. Recruiting roles, right? Yeah, well, that's what he's asking. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I would get... Uh, I would have one guy in, in charge of multimedia, mm-hmm. not just for the athletic department like they have. Like I know it used to be Bo Savage, and now they have other people doing it, like Jay Maline and Emily Starkey. I would have one guy just for the football team and give him one or two guys and let them go nuts. And then Taylor Bratt doesn't have to go over into that area because he's in that area more than he should be. Um, and then that obviously is taking away time that he – I mean, the dude still has a bunch of time and it's still – forming the best relationships of anyone, even more than a coach is. So I don't know how he finds all the time in the day to do this, but he does. <laughs> he needs a little help. Uh, turns of a val- I wouldn't put as much more into a guys looking. They can just freaking, you know, break down film. They already have mm-hmm. Chuck Lilly there. The coaches are really good at it. I, I just, I don't, I don't see that as a necessary thing. I would, I would probably hire some coaches that cost a little bit more money because the ones that get paid a little bit more usually have are pretty good recruiters. There's a reason why they get paid a little bit more. Nothing against some of the current coaches, but I think I can just go out and get a better coach recruiter because some of these coaches got to recruit better, and I think that that goes into it. I don't know that there's a lot of other ancillary, ancillary stuff, um, glitz and glamour and, and Stuff of that nature, right? In terms of what they do, and, and they could, their creative department's pretty good. So, I, I guess I'm a little bit of rambling here because I don't, I don't know if I can really put my finger on it. But they probably, I think you'd lay it out. Yeah, but I do think they need more staffers. Even even if they're going to have like big visit weekends, they, I mean, think about big visit weekends um, in football. You know, some some schools they'll they'll freaking you know have 60, 70 kids in. Mm-hmm. You know, building those relationships with those schools, even if the kids don't matter to them, they'll get that coach in and, you know, chill out and, and talk a bunch of game with him. But th- for those 70 kids, they'll still have like seven or eight people. I mean, can't they, they bring in 75 kids? It's three people mm-hmm. in charge of 75. It's hard to do. You have a lot of players um, not getting a lot of interaction during a lot of that visit, if that's the case. So just more people. Have you ever been embarrassed when covering recruiting? You ever had an embarrassing moment when covering recruiting? That's his last question. JJM22. I'll, I'll embar- call you out. Not, not embarrassing for myself. Uh, embarrassing for a Kansas State coach, I would say. And I know you know this story, and you probably don't know what I'm about. I'll share it. Is it recent? No, it's not recent. Okay, then yeah. Um, sure. But I'll share it. And I feel, and, and I'm doing it on the KSO show, and I think, I don't know if I even shared it premium before. But this is when Kai Thomas was still an uncommitted recruit, and he was visiting Kansas State for a Saturday after playing at Topeka on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. And he was still uncommitted, you know, down at K-State. We're thinking KU, Minnesota, all these other schools, and he's the top target. And But this was before Chris Kleiman was hired. This was the season before that. So he already had Kansas State offers, Kansas offers, and some other schools. This was when he was probably like a freshman or sophomore, still young. And – that's still one of your big time recruits. You got to know who he is. And I saw a Kansas State coach, and I'm not going to say his name now that I think about it because I'm not going to be that guy. But there was a Kansas State coach on Bill Snyder's last staff that went up to him and asked him what his name was. This, this is a recruit that is visiting Kansas State for a football game, <laughs> yeah. an in state recruit from Topeka, Kansas, that has plenty of Power Five offers, including one from the Wildcats. And he went up to Kai Thomas and didn't know who he was. I don't. I mean, those types of things just can't happen. So that was embarrassing, just to watch in full because that that happened on the sideline before the game. I was, you know, I go to the sideline yep. before games and stuff. Um, wasn't able to this past season, but always have before. My turn. I got one. It's not very embarrassing, but yeah. I'll throw it out here. Uh, the um, Donovan Williams, you know, debacle 
when K State basically had that wrapped up, he told the coaches that he was going to go to K State, mm-hmm. and and yeah, within like the week that he finally like put together a video or whatever, he flipped to Oklahoma State. I think I called him. I think it was a scheduled call. I don't remember if it was scheduled or not, but I called him, and he got on the phone, and he, I, I, he thinks I'm someone else completely. He thinks I'm, I don't know if he thinks I'm the Oklahoma State Rivals guy or 247 guy or what, but I don't think he, yeah, he had no clue that I was calling, and I don't. if he knew who I was, he would not have answered, but he answered, and truthful guy, nice guy, honestly, Donovan Williams is. Told me right then and there. I mean, I didn't like hearing it because it meant K-State wasn't going to get him. But he told me right then and there on the phone, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah. Because I told him, I'm the K-State guy. Yeah, I'm not going to go there anymore kind of thing. So that was interesting uh, to hear that from a recruit. He probably wishes he didn't even take my phone call. But mm-hmm. he was honest and, and nice about it. But it definitely pissed me off, you know, <laughs> right when it happened. But anyway, moving on. 96 Power Cat. You want to ask the question? Yeah, I'll ask the question. Uh, talk about player development. Who has Bruce recruited that improved during their time at K-State and stayed until graduation? Stokes, Brown, Wade. I mean, Dean Wade improved quite a bit. I mean, yes, Dean Wade was a good recruit, but Dean Wade was an NBA player as a senior. Guess what? He didn't arrive again and stay as an NBA player. He got, like you said, anyone else, so I get it. Um, Xavier Sneed was a very raw, not a basketball player at all when he arrived. Um, I would argue... He was still rough around the edges a little bit in his senior year and, and made us pull our hair out at times. But He um, improved. But, but, yes, where he didn't but, improve was ball handling. Yeah, which but, was, yeah but he, he didn't improve at what is the most common thing to a common fan. I understand that. He says, I don't think Snead ever reached his full potential. I mean, probably you could you could kind of say that. Yeah. But, shoot, Xavier Snead didn't know what he was doing in basketball at all when he arrived in Manhattan. That's how raw a player he was. He was more of a football player. And I I've, I said that when he was at Kansas State. That was a football player that they were trying to turn into a basketball player because he didn't want to play football anymore. He was a better football prospect. So to think that what they did with him, though, just to get to the point where he was a senior year is still impressive to me, I think. Um, so Xavier Sneed does fall into that umbrella for me. McCall Moeen definitely got better. McCall Moeen was... Very. <sighs> That's the thing. He's, he, I think he regressed from junior to senior year, though, possibly. But it might have just been because the role for him yeah, was but, much higher. But he he definitely progressed. That's the thing is all of them progressed. That's something that yeah, Bruce but, Weber can hang his hat on as player development. Uh, yeah, McCombe, we progressed, though, though. though. He was a prime. Yeah, no, he no doubt did. I'm just saying he didn't yeah, there do was much, a, there was obviously. A, there, was a, a, there was a point as a big, he might have been the best pick and roll defender in the Big 12, and he didn't get to Manhattan that way. So th- that's still progression no I, I get people want to overreact and say what oh what's bruce done what's you know bruce has made his bed and he is you can fault him and give him all the criticism in the world for going three and 15 in the big 12 last year and doing something similar this year and losing to ford hay state at home by 13 points don't get me wrong you should scorch the earth over that but that doesn't mean anyone gets the right to take away from the accomplishments that he does have and to say that oh my god barely anyone has ever gotten any better under Bruce? Um, I mean, that that's just... I, I'm not trying to say stupid question. I don't want to, but... Well, you, don't, you, you, you talked about Wade. You talked about Sneed. The biggest of them all is Barry Brown. Well, Talk about said, that player. He said though. anyone else besides those three. Besides Stokes, Brown, and Well... Wade. That's my thing. But here's my thing is, it's like, you don't win two Big 12 championships and get to an Elite Eight. As, as much as people want to disqualify, some of the luck for those things, everyone has luck. I'm just saying that I know we're all mad at Bruce right now, and there's a reason to be mad at Bruce for last season and this season. I get that. But don't sit here and try to strip away the good that he has done is all I want to say at this point. For And I get that people want to go back and have a revisionist history and be like, oh, look, we were so we were so lucky. We got that. We are so lucky that those things happened. And guess what? There is a lot of player development within the program. You don't get two Big 12 program championships at Kansas State by accident. We all know how many have they had in football since 1998. Big 12 championships are really hard to get. That doesn't mean Bruce Weber deserves a pass for the last year or this year. It does not. But to say he's barely developed anyone when he has two Big 12 titles in that time span, that just isn't correct. He's developed a lot of a lot of players, and a lot of them have gotten better under his watch. The problem that he has is that he lets the program drop off to a 
the most disastrously low cliff that anyone can stomach. And I get the, the criticism for that, but that doesn't mean you have to take away from the accomplishments well, that the, he does have. And part of the reason this is, you know, a criticism on him while you're talking all these, you know, things that you can't take away his accomplishments. I mean, after Stokes, Brown, and Wade, there isn't many guys you can talk about because of the attrition he's taking year after year after year. Yeah. That, and that's but, but the, something but, that but, he's done. Yeah, and that's my thing. I want people to get mad at the right thing. Exactly. Get Don't, mad at the attrition. Because the player development is something that Bruce Weber, like I said, can hang his hat on for his whole career, his get, whole life. Get, get mad at the lowest of lows. Get mad at the player attrition that caused the lowest of lows. Get mad that it falls off a cliff every time he does reach the pinnacle. I get that. And get mad at, at some of his, you know, you, when he has a good season, um, sometimes it gets tainted. Like his yeah. both of his Big 12 championship seasons – they lost early in the Big Twelve mm-hmm. or in the NCAA tournament. I get that. Get mad at that stuff, but get mad at the right things. Don't get mad and say, "Oh, now he's not a good coach because of this or that." He's still good. he was still was a good coach and, in some and, of those seasons. And that's one thing. I'm I, I'm not gonna say one way or the other whether, like you said earlier, K State should keep Weber or not. But he asks, "Do you think that this current group will improve if this current group stays together along with Bruce Weber?" And if for some reason it's another three four years, which I don't expect, but and plays our coaches throughout these guys' years, they will get better without they, a doubt. They will they will probably get close to winning another Big Twelve championship three years down the line. Yeah, that's the thing you'd have to wait for. I've uh, but that's also if you can keep the team. together. Yeah, so. I'm not so sure about that last line. Maybe I mean you have to keep the team. If the you don't even think if they kept the team together completely, no one and stop the attrition, which was hard to. No, I don't think there's enough talent, but I think you you, you can still they have until they turn. I teams. think there is enough talent. If these guys were experienced enough, I think Bradford, Pack, and Miguel, as juniors and seniors, could be very, very dangerous together. I think they could. I think it's an entire tournament team. I'm not sure it's a Big Twelve championship team, uh, but at the same time, what I will say, he says, "What makes you? What makes anyone think this current group will improve? Because he's done this before. Exactly. He's he's improved the core like this before, and they've already improved this year. I mean, they went from losing to four Hayes to now having two Big Twelve ones." Um, and they went from losing by 30 every night for a month and a half, two months, to the last month being competitive in nearly every ball game. I mean, things things suck right now. I get it. But you have to keep the right perspective. You said, what, what makes anyone think this current group will improve? It's improved in the last month. Now they're playing competitive basketball. They're not losing 30 every night like they did in the first half of the Big 12. They're not losing to Fort Hay State by 13. They're not losing to Baylor by 50. They're not looking uninspired anymore. They're in every ball game. Like, um, they finally got a damn win, and that's the thing is you said it earlier when they when they lost to I'm, Fort Hayes State, not, and we're not, they were not, on we're that not, roll of not, losses, and we're not trying to say jump on the Bruce train. Blah, blah, no, blah, but blah. when they when but, they lost those games, but don't say they're not improving. I I will personally say I lost hope. I said there's no way they win when they lost to Fort Hayes State. There's no way they win one conference right. game. And there, and, and there was a point where we got to like one and eight. One and nine in the Big Twelve, where you were even saying they were regressing. So yep. we're not sitting here being biased. Uh, yeah, because yeah, they, were. We're, yeah, they because were. the guys were hitting walls. Yeah. I think oh, that's really what yeah, it was. But yeah. that's part of the yeah. What but what I'm saying is there was a point we're not biased. There was a point that you said they're not getting better. They're not improving, mm-hmm. and that's when we were at the most dangerous part. But since that one and eight, one and nine, now I'm, we're sitting here. But are they two and thirteen? Mm-hmm. Right, two and thirteen. So I'm not saying, oh my gosh, these guys are world beaters now. So don't no. take, don't jump on our words here. But don't say they're not improving because at one eight one and nine, they literally they couldn't stay within twenty five points of anyone. Now they're uh, in, in, with Texas. In, in the last. I mean, that's, the, that's one of the best losses is that Texas. Yeah, game. in the last five or six games, I don't know that besides the KU game when they lost by eighteen, yep. only scored forty one points. But outside of th- those, the last six have been an improvement. So yep. you can't say they can't improve; they've already shown that they are. Which next, is even more impressive because I'd have given up. I said that on the board if I was on this team yeah. taking losses like that. But that goes to show. I think one more thing to add to that is shows how um, not to love up on Bruce, but he's able to keep his guys focused at least somehow. I would have lost focus a long time ago. This late into the season after taking that many blows under the belt. But moving on. If next year's on-field results in football are similar to this past season's results, how likely do you think it is that Chris Kleiman would fire some assistants? Uh, you know, let's hope that it doesn't. But if it were, then I think it would be more of a surprise if he didn't. Um, certainly seems like he might have came close this year. Is Chris Kleiman's recruiting progressing the way you thought it would? If not, what has been different than what you originally envisioned? Um, it hasn't. 
It hasn't progressed the way that I thought it would. I thought it would get better with the relationships. I don't think COVID has upset it that much to give him an incomplete pass. What has been different than what you originally envisioned? I, I envision him being better locally. I envisioned them not going through a lot like this, but I also didn't envision them, you know, collapsing like they did during last season. And maybe that figures into it a little bit as well. And I thought they would just get after it a little bit more than they do. Um, so I think that's what it is. Doesn't mean I'm down on them, but I'm going to just give it to you real. You know, this is Baller's to ask question, and he knows I will. But oh, you called him out? Yeah, progressing the. It's not progressing the way I thought it would. Is it good enough? Good enough for seven or eight wins still with the way they coach, I think, but not good enough for what they want to get accomplished. Do you think? Uh, do you give? I mean, that's the thing is everyone can use this excuse, but do you give them any sort of pass? at all with the COVID and happening? Do you think if COVID hadn't happened at all, if none of that debacle happened, they would still be in the same spot in progression of recruiting? Because that messed with a lot of things as far as culture and everything else. No, I know, but, you know, COVID affected recruiting, made a dead period, made visits, you know, not permissible. Yeah. It's hard. But but, but, but that should help you locally. Right. Absolutely. We said kids, uh-huh. they couldn't get these kids farther away. And it's not like they're going to Kansas kid, either. Yeah, so it's like, they yeah. say kids, they couldn't get these farther. No, no, so I'm not taking a shot at anyone here. But was like Kansas State struggled away from home because the home team is benefited because you can at least drive that campus, look around, wave or whatever. Um, so, that, yeah, I don't know that. It, in, it that's is. why I said I don't think that COVID is a big enough excuse for yeah. what's happening. I don't. Because – then they should be doing better at home. They're not yet. I want to see more. Okay. Said Ray Johnson County on the list of places you lived. It's the best place I've lived. I I've lived in Iowa City. I've lived in West Liberty, Iowa City, Iowa, West Liberty, Ohio, um, Ada, Ohio, which is Northwest Ohio. I've lived in Iowa City, Tampa, Florida. What really was St. Petersburg, Florida. I lived there for five or six months. Um, Johnson County is my favorite place I've lived. You live downtown Kansas City too, would you say? Oh, downtown. downtown. No, I like Johnson County more. But when I was when I was that age, I liked yeah downtown. But mm-hmm. the age, I still I like Johnson County more. One last realistic shot at a win at TCU. Well, they got it. Mm-hmm. Yep. So hey, he says this is who seems to get a win on the twenty twenty one side, and they did. Yay, we got a win, baby. <laughs> Another shot at a play and gave it to be told tournament as well. Yeah, I'd probably play TCU again, baby. Get the frogs three times. Let's try to win the series two one. <laughs> Due to the fact we missed out on the only twenty twenty two recruit that matters. Um I don't think King Crawford is the only one that matters. That's kind of a weird thing to say, I think. Yeah. Any twenty twenty three recruits we are looking good on. I mean, we'll 2023 is but. real early, but I would say, you know, the one that everyone's going to be anxious for is Dylan Edwards throwing mm-hmm. back in a derby. So um, let's get tuned up for that one. Probably K State versus the Pokes battle. He's the legacy. Pops uh, likes the Cowboys a little bit, though. I'm worried about that one. Like, I just think he's a really good player. That's the thing is, eventually it could get, I feel like, expand out of those two schools, too. He is a smaller back, but we'll man, he's see. got the skill. Yeah, we'll see. He might be too small for some, yeah. some schools. Yeah. What do you think? Who do you think will be the stars in the offensive line? Ooh, that's a tough question today because a lot can happen between now and opening day. But I am tempted to say opening day or is, this is hard. You know Noah Johnson's going to start again. Noah Johnson starting at center. You know Cooper Taylor, Beebe's going to start. And Taylor Portier starting at guard. Portier. That's three right there. But, but I don't know Portier. where I'm putting Cooper Beebe, so I, I'll have to figure it out. No, so because it depends on who's available and who's ready and who isn't. At this time, I'm close to something different, but I'm going to say Christian Duffy left tackle, Cooper Beebe right tackle still. Getting close on some of the younger tackles, being ready to go for prime time, but I got to go with tackles, Duffy, BB, guards, Portier, and Revis, center, Noah Johnson. That's my line. Who do you foresee being the center once Noah Johnson is gone? Uh, don't sleep on Hadley Panzer. Hearing some steam on that one. Will the young guys be able to beat out Revis, Revis or Johnson? Uh, there is potential if a tackle is ready for prime time. And I'm talking with Mitchum, 
Carver Willis to get if BB it, back inside. If they're ready, then they could slide BB back inside with Podier and Noah Johnson. That's what they now would take, and then Josh Revis has got a battle on his hands at that point with with Podier, Taylor Portier. So, and I'll and I'm doing this for the podcast that we do this once or twice a year where I give out premium information like this. But for for those of you listening that really like this kind of conversation but aren't subscribed, um, just subscribe and you'll get it every day. Um, will the younger guys be able to be out of Reavers or Johnson? Like I said, I think Noah Johnson's starting no matter what. I think Ben Adler's lost his job at this point. Um, he can get it back, but I think he's lost his job to Taylor Portier at this point. And I think Josh Reavers has to have a good offseason to keep his. Why do we suck so much right now? <laughs> uh, well, we'll wait a few weeks. Things can turn. Things can turn. Um, basketball, t- I, 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 told, I was telling someone, we were in a group chat, I think, and I said, hey, Lon Kruger, we know the Kansas State plays the Sooners today if you're listening to this on Tuesday. Tuesday? Yeah, yeah. Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Lon Kruger always lays an egg at least once a year against K-State. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it happens in Manhattan. So watch it, man. They beat Oklahoma. They beat Iowa State in that rescheduled game the first week of March. They knock off TCU in the mm-hmm. first round of the Big 12 tournament. That's three more wins that I can yep. see being realistic. Or they, they get their faces smashed in tonight, if you're listening to this, Tuesday uh, against the Sooners. It could happen as well. I'm picking a loss, but I don't know about smashed. We'll see what happens. Doesn't this Kent State basketball team need another? This is kind of something we already talked about. We talked about this, and I will say, SRE Cat, you're right. They need more guards, and, and they made a mistake by not recruiting enough guards. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting. They It's Last few years, they like to keep a spot open too, which is they had so, so weird. And the, yeah, and and they 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 recruited so many forwards is what they did. Yeah, guys, but if they would have just added at least one more guard, it could have been at least a little. And they could have yeah. they had that extra spot, especially to do it. when when Luke can probably played the two and he was out for so long, it made it even worse. Yeah, no, it's just I'm always gonna keep saying like they David don't, Sloan could they, be but, on this but team, they've done they this, but they've done this since anyone. we were at Case One 2017. It always seems like they're a guard short. Yep. Even Barry played 38, 39 minutes a freaking night. No, that could have that could have made a big difference back then, for sure. Pretend your Gene decided to fill out some potential basketball coach replacements and get Brad under what it call. Brad said he absolutely wants to be the basketball coach, but wants to stay at Illinois another two seasons. Would you accept that offer? Or keep Bruce for two more seasons? You'd also have to keep that agreement a secret from me and fans. Yes. Yeah, I would do it because I, I don't think you're going to get a better um, – Kidding at the Brad Underwood. Yeah. And, if, if he wanted in, yeah. And I, and, and, but and, you and, and I also and don't. It's two more seasons. Yeah. Like, as bad as it is now, it's going to be better than this season. I mean, it's not going to be good enough, but it's going to be better than this season. So you're talking about next two seasons are probably the stomachable seasons for Bruce. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. You can't, you can't get much worse than the last two seasons. You would, so. well, don't say that. Don't. I'll say it. Because <laughs> if it does, then it's like, man. How big is the Crawford loss? I already I wrote yep. it, but I I mean I, I think everyone just likes to self loathe a little bit because I know that ACB four sixty three, I know you you read every post I make on the board and I've said over and over how bad it, I like I know you wanted to hear me say it because you want to self loathe a little bit and it, and it and people are frustrated and upset that they lost Caden Crawford to Iowa, but I've said it it's a significant loss those are the kinds of in state pools you have to get mm-hmm. so yeah it, it's big. How bad is it for the coaching staff? Yep, more uh, I mean, self-loathing. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that's it, it ties into the first question. Yeah. they got to get this stuff done. I'm becoming very pessimistic. Uh, shock. No, I'm just kidding. I love you. I'm just kidding. That this staff will ever be more than a 7-5 staff. <laughs> yeah. D.Y. mentioned that the, that, that is a goal, but that they need to win their crew battles like they lost just lost in Crawford. Did you think they can do this? Yeah. I, I thought they could do it. I, I still think they might, but I think you're right in the way that they're recruiting. We're looking at seven and five, eight and four, you know, repetitively. A little I think it's bit. BS, man. Seven and five is the, the best you think Clyde could what, ever do. I mean, until they, they step up a tier, I think that's what we're looking at still. They got to step up a tier. Yeah, I guess I can understand that. But I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's. Two I, I view, I view it. but I view seven and five, eight and four as the same thing. Absolutely. I just to think, you, it's a little bit different, I think. I think you think they can win nine or ten the way they were not this year, not this year. But I think in the I still believe in the staff. Oh, I, uh, but yeah, but but he says if they recruit like this, or is this will oh, they ever be? Yeah, we're, we say recruiting has to improve for it to be more than a seven five staff. 
Absolutely. Like, I, yeah, that's that's a no doubt. That's a no brainer. That's a no brainer. Yeah, they have to do a little bit better recruiting. I think they can, but you're right, and but he's right in thinking that seven, five, eight, and four ceiling, maybe. I hope not. Do you think Kleiman will get rid of coaches that aren't pulling their weight with either recruiting or player development? Uh, yeah, I think it's already happened before. I mean, I, I don't think that him and Chris. I mean, I think he wanted some changes. The whole Jason Ray thing looks he's a little weird. The Chris Dawson thing is a little weird. Um, no, I think did you, I? I don't think that people need to worry about. Chris Kleiman hanging on to coaches too long. If he hangs on to a coach too long, it's probably it's, not his fault. it's probably because of a little bit of the pandemic going on yes. here in terms of funds and everything as well. So uh, that's what I think. I, I think people uh, just kind of think a little bit too linearly right right now and forget that we're dealing with the pandemic that has caused the, the school to lose so much and have to remember that some of these decisions are frankly out of Chris Kleiman's hands. Mm-hmm. I know that it is still only February, but the Crawford loss is huge. Okay, we're back to Crawford. With so many top Kansas recruits leaving the state, do you think it's something with the kids just want to leave the state, or is it a failure on the staff? A little bit of both. I think maybe the, the kids do want to leave the state, but it's up to Kansas State to give them a reason not to. Mm-hmm. So a little bit. Yeah. I've, I've, I've always felt that way, and I'm not going to change that way just because I like these guys. When you don't get it, you can't just say, we want kids to want to be here. No, you no. need to convince them to want to be here. And guess what? If they just want to leave the state, you know, I, I, I have a hard time seeing that too because there's a lot of Kansas kids on this roster. Yep. You can't just lose just the best ones. You can't. So, um, love the staff, always will. But it's a little bit of a failure, but they can be corrected. But it, I, I don't like it when people say, oh, they just don't want to leave the state. Yes, I do think that's the case. But I think you can change that line of thinking. Mm-hmm. That's my thing. When does Bruce announce retirement? Has to happen, right? Uh, uh, no. I don't think so. Not this year. How big a battle will it be to get Ikenna Isiagu? Um, probably a little bit more of a premium question, but I will say I'm not going to get into details. But it's a battle. That's not going to be easy. That's probably why he asked that for those that maybe not be a premium member. And we'll give them a little care here as to why they should, because next man up after King Crawford is probably Ikenna Isiagu, who is a defensive end at Blue Springs. Regarding the King Crawford situation, Oh, you definitely started this thread uh, right after they lost Caden Crawford, didn't you? Well, it was, it was literally at midnight after they lost to Kansas. Well, I was there's a lot of people wouldn't... pissed about Caden Crawford yeah. still. <laughs> By all accounts, he was a perfect fit at Kansas State, and his recruitment was very promising. Any insight into what went wrong? Um, better relationships at Iowa. Uh, didn't give him enough reason to stay. I can't put a finger on it. It's a miss. Um, that's one they should have had with the connections that they had to him, how good he is, they they have to win that one. Yeah, because if they win that one, they could lose out on a lot of other ones and look still decent. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't Yeah, it doesn't help losing Landon Dean and then right after that losing Caden Crawford at all. Both in-state guys going out of state. So even I was seen surprised by commitment, which is something I reported for those non-premium. Mm-hmm. I they were surprised, I mean, that one is, which yeah, makes that you wonder if it was not as much that I was impressed as something was a miss at K State. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I, I understand that line of thinking. Maybe they just they got coaches have to get as close to these kids as Taylor Bright does. Here's some optimism on Crawford. At least he didn't go to a Big Twelve school, a, another Big Twelve school. Yeah, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't like moral victories. <laughs> That's a moral victory. Absolutely, and I'm just I'm just throwing out any. Are, that's a loser mentality. What if you went to though? Iowa State, how how, how much more? A loser. How much more would the the flames be lit if he went to Iowa State? Oh, well, they would be lit. But me and you just talking here on a podcast. I don't want that loser mentality. Oh my god, get the hell out of here! I want to say a different word. <laughs> can't. Do you really think Weber will be retained? It just can't find more last night. Where last night's results are acceptable, COVID or not. That was right after they lost to KU 59 41. We got a lot of these questions at, at the lowest point of Kansas State I fandom. Know. But I will be honest, at this point, and I know we have had this behind a premium wall, there is much more momentum for Bruce Weber to stay than to leave. Are you hearing if kids are pushing to leave their backyards for schools for the way more than normal because of the pandemic? I know this sounds backwards, but hear me out. Are kids so burned out from the past year, plus they want to change the scenery more than normal and are willing to jump out on the state schools they haven't visited before? You know what? That's yeah, interesting. I, I get the, I like the thought process, but guess what? Kansas State missed on a lot of kids, not 
from, from well, they missed on a lot of kids from far away last year. We blamed it on the pandemic. Uh, we can't blame the pandemic on because they're not getting kids nearby too. Yep. So uh, there there is a common denominator here, and it's that I don't think the pandemic is having as much impact on the losses as as, as we are anticipating or, or said at one point or someone to say now because guess what. They got they missed out on kids far away, pandemic. Missed out on kids nearby, pandemic. Uh, well, maybe it's just not the pandemic. Maybe they just got to do better. That's where I'm at. Why do we lose head-to-head battles with schools like Iowa State, Nebraska, Minnesota, etc.? What is the deciding factor in ways to recruit? The excuse is we are unable to get recruits to kids or visits, but that applies to everyone, not just us. That's not an excuse. I never used that an excuse. I don't I don't know where that came from. They also beat Nebraska for kids, too. Not as many as they lose, obviously. They also beat Iowa State for recruits, too. Um, I mean, it goes back and forth. People remember the losses more than the wins a little bit. Well, now, I mean, but, but most specifically recent, to that question, you can't get recruits on campus now, but I realize that he's yeah, asking about yeah, past years. Yeah, we could. But, but, I mean, I know everyone has a two-month memory when it comes to recruiting, but you put it across the scale – it's a little bit more competitive than what we're making out to be. Mm-hmm. They lose kids because they got to do better at getting to know them. You can't lose a kid because you didn't know you didn't want to be a linebacker. Mm-hmm. That happened before. So I'm being a little redundant here, but these coaches. On the climbing staff? Though? Yeah. Yeah. These coaches have to get to know these kids more. They can't just rely on Taylor Brat the entire time. KSU football assistant coaches that are on the hot seat to perform well this year as well as recruit better. Mm. Yeah, not touching uh, that. Not touching that one, buddy. Sorry, that was form cat question. And but the that, next one, yeah. But you, you, lo- you, you love my information, so I will pass on your question. Um, how will well, Bruce I mean, keep? That is an interesting question. Actually, actually not a bad question. How how will Bruce keep his job here at Kansas State? Meaning he will be back in 2022, 2023. We'll get to a tournament, thing. at least. Uh, if not, I mean, I mean, yeah. Well, well, I think he'll be back next year. But you're talking about. 20 a the year second after. year, he has to make he has to make a postseason next year. Yeah, yep, at least. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Probably the NCAA tournament. I don't know if NIT. Yeah, that's enough. the thing. Is because that NIT. That's what I'm talking about. You got to be at least a bubble, that's a bubble three, yeah. tournament team at the very very yeah. least. Yeah, you can be a bubble and make it. Maybe in the first four, maybe that works. Yeah, but, but NIT even next year looks bad to me because that's three straight years without an NCAA tournament, and I don't think a power. Six is a power six in the basketball. Yeah, high major, high major, better. Mm-hmm. That's a, I don't think a high major school can be content with three straight years without NCAA tournament appearance. I agree. So, I think you have to have higher standards than that. Mm-hmm. I was going to Especially ask what to put offices. the nail in little Bruce's coffin, <laughs> but without even reading any of their posts, I'm sure the subject was broached. <laughs> he is correct. <laughs> Left out a word. Uh, With the caveat that you don't get to attend practice or beat around the players on a regular basis, are there any changes that you would make for these last few basketball games in terms of starters and minutes rotation? What they're doing now, I think, is what you have to do. Um, I think they've gotten better. I think they've gotten better at making sure. I mean, obviously, Selton's back in the starting lineup. I didn't like when they had him held out. Here, yeah, here's my thing. Um, I, they they made some very bad moves, I think, during the season at periodic times where they were letting Easy Agu chew away at Davion Bradford's minutes way too much. And they were letting people like Antonio Gordon and whoever else eat away at Celta Miguel's minutes. Maybe Antonio Gordon's not the right example, but Celta Miguel would... Or, it was Easy Agu at one time because they started Easy Agu and Bradford bigs. at the same time. Yeah, they started two bigs. But there, but there was also times where Sal Miguel they didn't even have closing out games, and I didn't like that. He's the one who hit a buzzer beater to beat Omaha. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the guy that can handle the ball. So lately, there's not a whole lot that's been upsetting me in terms of minutes and rotation. But I will say, throughout the times of the year, the only things that really, I'll say it, piss me off is when they take minutes away from guys that they need to be impressing and they need to get experience, which is Celta Miguel and Davion Bradford. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Nigel Pack always has gotten his minutes. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the only Because we could be, be honest. They screwed it up because there's no way that Celta... Well, we could say they screwed it up if these guys leave with Bruce still coming but back. Even, but, but even if they do come back, they screwed it up because that's valuable experience. Those are the guys you have to be playing. Are you trying to win five games or are you trying to get better? I agree, and they're trying to win five games so they can come back next year. I but know, but I will that, but, say they, but, but, that but, time, but but also Selton and Davion are 
better too. So no, there's no doubt about that. So the, even if you say they're kind of get back five games, the, I think that was atrocious what they did back then. I'm just saying I'm not going to say it was it was awful. Yeah, that's the experience that they missed. But I don't. I'm not going to say it's awful until those guys leave because of that. Yeah, but even if they don't leave because of it, it doesn't mean it's not freaking awful. Those are the guys you have to be playing. And I disagree wholeheartedly. I think it was bad. It was horrible, but it was not bad enough for me to think they're gonna that that all all of a sudden means they can't be a conference all conference caliber players down the line just because they didn't get those few games in the middle of the twenty 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 one season. Yeah, I just think it was bad coach. It was. Yeah. It was. It was absolutely bad roster management at that moment. But now I think they're doing fine. Um, I mean, if Mike didn't have a great game last game, I probably would stick with saying have him come off the bench. But, I mean, he proved yeah. he deserves to start on a team that needs him to start. And uh, I think you eventually have to get Dejuan Gordon back into the starting lineup. But they're easing him back in because of injury. Yeah. No, yeah. Besides that, I mean, I think the starting lineup's good until Dejuan Gordon's done Free with Antonio. any soreness. For Antonio. For Antonio. And then Antonio will, you know, I guess Although Dejuan fits a six man, yeah, role. You know, I kind of like him as a six man, but we'll see if that continues. Yeah, he fits a six man role probably pretty well. And Antonio starting is not a bad thing because he's gone away from trying to be hero ball ever. Yeah, he's no, actually no, fit a role. no, I don't mind the way they do that. And and I know Ma- Mike's best role is a six man too, but they also can't. that's why next year I but, would put, <laughs> but they can't have him not start. No, that's why next year they need to get a transfer that can come in and take Mike's starting spot right away and let Mike be a six man if he wants to come back. Yeah, those would be the only mistakes I think they made with minutes of rotation was handling of Selton and Davion at certain points in a season. I, I guess I want to see more Luke, but that's more curiosity. He really hasn't earned it at this point. No, no, he's and but that's another guy that. Needs the experience. He's gotten a little bit here and there, and it's it's been good. Um, but Selton and Davion, Selton's was bad, and Davion's mm-hmm. was even worse. When he wasn't dealing with foul trouble and, and not playing him, that was the biggest yeah. glaring mistake. In yeah, case. and to be honest, because he has been a victim of foul trouble, though, I'm not saying that all of a sudden he's not going to be all big 12 at some point, but that's also why they needed to play him more than they did because he takes minutes away from himself because of his own foul trouble. No, he so does. his minutes are. I mean, he's not going to have the same amount of minutes. Well, this else. last game, he only had 13 minutes, yeah. four fouls. And now, in 13 and yeah, minutes. and now it's his fault, not the coach's. But that's what I'm saying. The coach's fault kind of gets exacerbated a little bit there because Dave Allen's not going to end up playing that as many minutes, near as many minutes as Nigel's going to miss how many games and probably still have more minutes than Dave Allen this year. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think the Davion thing, we could probably argue a little bit there. That one might be end up a little bit more critical because Davion's going to end up with not a ton of minutes because of foul trouble. And that's his own foul trouble. And but that, but I will say during that stretch when we were talking about how bad that was, yeah. they, he wasn't dealing with foul trouble for some reason. They were favoring Eziegu, and it just wasn't the right call. Yeah. The te- and the Texas A and M game was real bad. Yeah. No, that was awful. I mean, they, and especially they, because the he didn't because play. Dejuan Gordon got hurt early. Yeah, in that he had, game. He had zero, reason. and he had zero fouls, and he went from eight minutes to two minutes without playing. And there's definitely an argument there because they were leading that game at that point. How do you play? They could have stretched a lead out. They, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But if they manage Davion a little bit better, they probably beat Texas A&M. Yeah, and I mean that's a win that they needed too, but. Well, I mean, whatever. They get a win now, and now they can try to beat Oklahoma today, tomorrow, whenever you're listening to this. And that was the last question. Was it? Yeah. Is that all of them? There's a lot of posts, but none of them have questions. So, all right. We're yeah. done. All right, we're we? done. Well, thank you for listening to the KSO Show. For Grant Flanders, for Derek Young, I'm Grant Flanders. <laughs> thank you again. You can take us. Take us home, D.Y. Tell your friends!